Lily Nichols, welcome to the Homegrown Podcast. I'm super excited to chat with you today. Your book was incredibly influential in my third pregnancy. Actually, I would even go as far to say as it completely changed my life and was a big piece of writing the first nutrition curriculum. Mm. I don't know if you know this, but a lot of the stuff I was learning through Lily's book and her research-oriented perspective and approach to dietetics and nutrition. I was like, how can we formulate this to teach kids about real food? So Lily, welcome to the show. We're excited to have you. Thank you for the invite. I remember definitely seeing the book and you talking about it. Real food for pregnancy. But I didn't, yeah, I mean, it, I, I, I wasn't there with you on that journey oh, as yeah. much as you were for sure. It's so. phenomenal. I think I, that's my number one most recommended book for anyone who is even thinking about maybe getting pregnant at some point in their life. I mean, it's huge. Um, Thank you. As we dive in, I want to start out talking about some of the differences in maybe what we might experience when we go to our traditional OB's office and they give us the rundown of foods that we should eat when we're, you know, in early pregnancy and throughout. And the stuff you talk about in your book, this critical nutrients and really important foods, the real food for pregnancy. Break us, break it down for us. What are some of the things that we can be um, working into our diet in that important time of life. So the information you will or won't get from your healthcare provider, I mean, it's probably going to be vast, vastly different than the information that I cover in Real Food for Pregnancy. Um, it depends on the provider, of course, but if you're in more of like a traditional OB kind of a setting, uh, you know, it, it's not their fault necessarily, but medical schools really have very little built-in nutrition education. So unless it's a provider who's done a lot of outside work, um, educating themselves or has some additional training and nutrition, they really might not be a great source of information. Um, often what you can expect is like a, a handout, mm -hmm. uh, like a one pager or a brochure that might have I mean, it's really minimal information. It might be like, oh, you need some extra calories in the second and third trimester, and then um, don't drink alcohol, limit your caffeine, and avoid this long list of foods due to risk of, you know, foodborne illness or food poisoning. And that's that's usually the extent of information you're going to get. Um, of course, we have some really great, well-educated providers as well out there, but. It, few and far between in kind of a conventional medical setting. Um, that was actually a big reason that I thought Real Food for Pregnancy needed to exist. There is just a lot of controversy in the prenatal space. I have worked in conventional prenatal health care and then, of course, outside of that in my own private practice and at the public policy level with the state of California's diabetes and pregnancy program. So it's like just seeing prenatal nutrition from so many different angles, there's just a massive gap in education. And there's also a massive gap just in the conventional guidelines as well. Like we have so much new science pointing us towards what might be optimal for mother's health, health for reducing the risk of pregnancy complications or for optimizing baby's development that just have not made it into the guidelines. So for me, I tend to focus on emphasizing nutrient dense foods. We know that the needs for a lot of different micronutrients increase pretty dramatically during pregnancy. And so just giving standard advice of eat more calories doesn't necessarily mean that people are going to be eating more nutrient dense foods. And mm -hmm. so I really try to prioritize those nutrient dense foods, the ones that have the micronutrients for which the needs increase during pregnancy, um, which also tend to be the micronutrients that a lot of women are falling short on or already coming into pregnancy with a deficiency. So uh, a lot of my recommendations include animal source foods because those do tend to be the most nutrient dense for a lot of these micronutrients. So B12, iron, zinc, choline, preformed vitamin A, et cetera. Um, so meat on the bone, slow cooked meat, bone broth, like eating animal foods nose to tail is, is huge for a number of reasons. Um, seafood, especially some of the fatty fish, um, shellfish is particularly nutrient dense. Um, from eating nose to tail, also including some organ meats in your diet, which gets controversial by conventional guidelines, and we can go into that if you want to, but um, including liver in the diet every once in a while. 
really does help fortify the diet with a lot of different vitamins and minerals. Um, of course, vegetables and other plant foods have their place, um, high quality dairy products, but really we're talking about, you know, foods that haven't been processed excessively, at least in a way that would reduce their nutritional value, their micronutrient content, and really emphasizing our, our protein rich foods. The foods mm -hmm. that are richest in protein are usually the richest in micronutrients and needs for both of those increase during pregnancy. That's so interesting to me because protein is something we've been repeatedly discussing on this podcast about how the dietary recommended allowance or the daily recommend, whatever the RDA stands for, um, is so incredibly low. It's painful, right? And so does that even apply in pregnancy? And what have you seen um, protein? How, what is the protein role in pregnancy and why is that so important? Yeah, I was just uh, in a conversation on social media with somebody who's like, hey, what gives? I'm reading this article in this magazine saying that Americans are eating way too much protein, but you're always talking about eating more. And like, if, if your benchmark for what is adequate protein is the RDA, I mean, the RDA for women, when they base it on like, what they consider an average weight woman, which is a conversation for another time. Mm. It's 46 grams of protein per day. This is wow. nowhere near enough for an adult woman. It's about 10% of your calories coming from protein if you calculate it out that way. And in for pregnancy, there there is an acknowledgement that you need a little bit extra protein, but because the RDA benchmark is already so low, the slight increase for pregnancy is also inadequate and the recommendations for pregnancy were set without much data on pregnant women themselves like actually most of the nutritional guidelines for pregnancy are based on like mathematical estimates so you'd start with like the general rda or adequate intake level whatever benchmark you're using and then you add additional via some calculations for like the increased body weight um, mm -hmm. during pregnancy and what we um, assume is the amount that the fetus needs throughout the pregnancy. And so they're, they're really guesstimates. Um, as of 2015, we had our first ever study that directly measured protein requirements in pregnancy. And they found that the guidelines are set, uh, what was it, 30 I think it was 39% too low for early pregnancy mm -hmm. and for late pregnancy, they underestimated needs by 73%. Wow. So we're not talking about, oh, we had this best guess estimate, but we were like 5% off, like, okay, yeah. margin of error, like 73% too low is, is unacceptably low. And um, it shocks me that the guidelines still have not been updated from that new data. That really is the best data that we have. And uh, so at the very least, yeah, we need probably, you know, the RDA is set at 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight. And for late pregnancy, they they up it a little bit, but um, we need we need like double <laughs> the, the standard RDA um, in late pregnancy. Hmm. So my question, people are getting the pamphlet every day the pamphlet right i mean it's like all the time right it's they're getting the, they're getting the recommendations from the pamphlet every single day i know and and i guess the, the question that's burning inside me is is like what what are, what's the variation in experience that we're seeing from a kind of traditional to a hey i'm i'm getting into a more nourished lifestyle while i'm pregnant or pre-pregnancy mm-hmm what is the difference in the like experience of a pregnancy or the yeah, like what's the provider? variations that we're seeing? So like, like the health is improved. Are we seeing um, okay. easier like birth? Like I, I'm just curious about like what what the uh, upsides yeah, tend so the, to look the like. The upside, and and I apologize, I didn't answer that first part of the question. Is you know every cell in our body is essentially built of protein. So when you're growing a brand new human being from scratch in your system, that's all really heavily reliant upon protein. Mm -hmm. Not to mention your body as a mom is changing really significantly during pregnancy. I mean, you know, we've we've been through this or two of us on the call have been through this. Yeah. I mean, it's insane the way that your body expands to accommodate a growing baby. 
and, and birth and postpartum recovery and nursing. I mean, it's all just absolutely miraculous and mind boggling. Um, that all requires more protein. So like the, the uterus at term at the end of the pregnancy has 800% more collagen in it than it did pre-pregnancy. Wow. And actually women who have had babies, their uterus actually permanently has more collagen than a woman who's never had babies. Like it permanently remodels. It goes through this breakdown phase postpartum and then like rebuilds itself with even more collagen. I'm like, this is probably why in subsequent pregnancies, everything just stretches so much more readily, right? It's like, oh yeah, I know how to do this. I've done this before. Yeah. Um, so you need it for both mom and baby. So some of the benefits that we see from increasing protein intake, we certainly see substantially better uh, blood sugar control. Protein is very helpful for blood sugar regulation, really reduces the amount that your blood sugar spikes after eating. So if you have uh, a typical meal that has like a mix of your macronutrients, fat, carbs, and protein, um, if you have a substantial enough portion of protein at the meal, your blood sugar will not spike nearly as much, even if the meal also has some carbs like potatoes or bread or rice or something like that. Um, so vital for blood sugar regulation. So we do see a major difference in um, whether there's gestational diabetes going on or not, substantial difference in like blood sugar spikes, um, maintaining energy levels, which directly relates to your blood sugar levels. Mm. We see better blood pressure, blood pressure and blood mm. sugar go hand in hand. So there is plenty of research showing that we might actually be able to reduce the risk of or severity of preeclampsia if we increase the protein a lot. And if you go back to some of like the old school recommendations on preeclampsia, like the brewer's diet, it was high protein. I mean, he definitely, he didn't get everything right, but he definitely got that right. Um, and then in terms of baby, we see uh, better growth. So we have plenty of studies showing uh, the difference in fetal growth, uh, risk of like intrauterine growth restriction or low birth weight baby um, when we're getting sufficient levels of protein. Uh, so we do see benefits on that regard as well. And there's actually some amino acids that have some specific and unique roles in things like fetal brain development, like taurine, for example, which is a, a amino acid that's only found in animal sourced foods. So it does seem to, to offer benefits to baby as well. Mm. It makes sense because protein is literally like the building blocks of life. I mean, I think I read that in your book and like, that's how I think of protein now. And even yeah. now, I prioritize protein as a macronutrient and everything else just seems to fall into place. I yep. never over consume my mm -hmm. carbs when I'm upping my protein and I'm hitting like, I'm hitting uh, a gram of protein per ideal body weight. I don't know how you feel about that calculation. Great, great ballpark. Yeah. Okay. It's Cause it's really been working well for me. So I'm around like anywhere between 120 to 140 grams protein for my height. And, um, it's, I'm telling you, I've been logging my, my food every single day for almost 35 days and I've never once overeaten carbs. I think my blood sugar has never been more regulated and I have yep. done the CGM thing. I've, I've regulated my blood sugar for eight weeks on it, like straight and was shocked at what blood sugar spikes did occur even eating like a whole food real ancestral oh, diet yeah. it's incredible yeah the nuance there is so important um and this whole blood sugar piece is so interesting to me so i love that you're talking about the importance of protein because for me it's like if that's your guiding like your north star it seems like everything else is more effortlessly falling into place yes. just naturally like not even a lot of willpower like i don't even deal with food cravings now because my protein is on track yes but for the for the blood sugar piece what is it about pregnancy that leads to things like gestational diabetes? Like what is it in the body that, that now all of a sudden is mounting these symptoms for us? And then how can we utilize food? So say I am pregnant and I have the gestational diabetes diagnosis. Talk to us about things you can do um, to offset that and maybe go control it with food. Yes. So there's, I mean, first of all, I completely agree with you on the, uh, the protein front. It just kind of fixes everything, it especially does. if you get sufficient protein at breakfast specifically, if we can yes. just give one more little nod to this makes a massive difference for everything. And I have 
many, many posts going into this, there's a ton of research showing that having a protein rich breakfast in particular mm -hmm. really sets the stage for blood sugar balance and hormonal regulation for the rest of the day. And this yeah. is especially true in pregnancy. So yes to the protein. Um, as to the gestational diabetes conversation, uh, there's a lot happening with blood sugar regulation throughout pregnancy. And there's, there's a lot of, uh, I think, misconceptions, both conventionally and in the more like holistically minded um, birth space on gestational diabetes. I think because gestational diabetes has been so overly medicalized, mm. um, there's misunderstandings on both <laughs> sides of the coin. And I find myself straddling both worlds as somebody who's like worked conventionally and seen like the really significant adverse outcomes when you don't identify and manage um, elevated blood sugar in pregnancy and also being such a staunch advocate for low intervention birth and home birth and midwifery care, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. um, the middle ground, what's happening is we have kind of like ancestrally built in mechanisms in our body to promote baby's growth, even if maternal nutrition is challenged in some way. So historically, humans faced famine and starvation on the regular. Mm -hmm. If you don't have like built in mechanism to make sure that nutrients first and foremost, including like blood sugar energy are going to flow to that baby to maintain baby's growth. Um, you're going to have a problem. And so we, we do have that mechanism and that goes by way of insulin resistance that especially develops in the latter stage of pregnancy. So by default, your pancreas, um, begins producing more insulin during pregnancy, mm -hmm. um, to preempt this, uh, insulin resistance that happens in, in the latter half of pregnancy. So essentially your body wants to maintain a sufficient amount of energy and nutrient supply to the baby. So if you make the maternal tissues insulin resistant, like, Hey, you don't take up this extra energy, send it to the baby. Instead, you're guaranteeing a sufficient flow of nutrients for that baby's growth. Now where we're at <laughs> as a species nowadays, I mean, we are surrounded by food 24 seven. Mm -hmm. Our food is not very nutrient dense and it is excessively high in refined carbohydrates. I mm -hmm. mean, 85% of grains consumed in the U S are refined carbohydrates. 60% of calories for the average American come from ultra processed food. 90% of which wow. is sugar or refined carbohydrates. I mean, we just have like way too much low quality carbohydrates and refined sugars coming in that when you already have a situation where your body's trying to be like, whoa, that sugar is not for me. It's for the baby's growth. You end up with elevated maternal blood sugar. But our built-in mechanism in our body is to prevent maternal blood sugar from going high because we're pumping out more insulin than ever in late pregnancy. I mean, insulin production can double or triple in late pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And actually maternal blood sugar is designed to be maintained at a lower level during pregnancy than it is outside of pregnancy. Your body is mm -hmm. like very obsessed with keeping your blood sugar at a very stable and steady state. Mm -hmm. But the situation we're in with like the nutritional climate, not to mention more than half of Americans have some form of diabetes or prediabetes, most of which is undiagnosed. A lot of what we're actually seeing in pregnancy is prediabetes or undiagnosed diabetes that we're just catching in pregnancy because mm. we're not routinely testing everybody's blood sugar. Mm. Um, moreover, the benchmarks for abnormal blood sugar are set arbitrarily high, but in pregnancy, they're kind of strict. And so a we're testing and B we're catching, um, more cases. Mm -hmm. So if you actually screen women's blood sugar in early pregnancy via like a hemoglobin A1C, which gives you a proxy of about the last two or three months of average blood sugar levels, you can actually catch the majority of cases, uh, that would so-called go on to develop gestational diabetes. But really what's happening is you're catching prediabetes. Um, so, you know, a, a high A1C, like an A1C in the pre-diabetic range, that's like over 98% predictive 
of that same Mm. woman so-called failing the glucose tolerance test. It's very highly correlated. (laughs) So um, there's a lot. There's some like built-in natural by design insulin resistance, but if all systems are functioning as intended and the diet's not excessively high in refined carbohydrates, we actually shouldn't be seeing high blood sugar in pregnancy. You actually see the opposite. You see it lower than average. Mm. Are you familiar with uh, Jesse in Chowsby? I never pronounce her last name right. Um, she yes. wrote uh, The Glucose Goddess. She wrote The Glucose Revolution. Absolutely. Um, yes. We did an Instagram live together several years ago. Oh, yeah. did you? Oh, she's phenomenal. I'd yeah, love to get great. her on the show. Her breakdown and description of glucose was one of the most helpful things. And for me, the question lingering in my head now that I worn the CGM and I feel like I've seen in real time what that looks like for me, how much it sounds like what you just said is that this gestational diabetes diagnosis that happens to come in pregnancy is often just underdiagnosed or missed maybe um, let's say metabolic dysfunction, that's just happening all the time, but we pick it up in pregnancy when we're monitoring those levels. And the other piece of this is like, like one of the feedbacks I got from wearing a CGM was like, well, our ancestors never had to do that. So why would we adopt that technology? And I'm like, well, our ancestors weren't surrounded by glucose as much as we are. Like the dietary landscape is frightening right now. If you don't, if you don't take a moment to pause and think through your, your choices, like it's everywhere. Our ancestors didn't have DoorDash. Right? They didn't have yeah. highly processed, ultra processed foods to the extent and availability and accessibility, incredibly low cost as we have. So if I'm understanding correctly, do you feel like this metabolic dysfunction at us a society, which is then manifesting itself as greater gestational diabetes in women, because we're finally looking at it, is mostly driven by our food choices and an overconsumption of glucose in general, leading to sort of this insulin resistance thing? Or are there more complexities happening within our bodies? Like it comes down to like, is it genetics or is it food environment type of thing? And it's both. Okay. And epigenetics. So, and epigenetics. um, it's the easiest to point the finger at excessive carb intake and, and sugars, right? Yeah. And mm-hmm. actually, I used to focus quite a lot of my education on like reducing carbohydrates. And I've actually shifted that over the years to increasing protein because you, yes. you really need to like replace it with something. But also, it it's a two birds with one stone situation. You increase the protein, you don't even have the room in your stomach for more carbs. Um, and you kind of, you know, you get there, but we do need to have certainly conversations about carbohydrate quality because, you know, the food environment with ultra processed foods and food companies literally engineering foods to be highly, highly addictive. Um, the, the book wired to eat goes through all that, that, that in itself is a major problem. We have low quality, highly oxidized fats from this excessive and unnatural quantity of seed oils we're now consuming that just causes mitochondrial dysfunction. Like your body cannot metabolize energy the way that it should. Poor quality Mm -hmm. fats is a major contributor. Under consumption of protein, major contributor. Mm -hmm. You also have... um, a variety of toxins that impair your uh, insulin production and ins- insulin signaling. So a lot of different chemicals in our environment can lead to worsening insulin resistance and metabolic dysfunction. And then I think another thing I want to mention is that, you know, the human, like our bodies are essentially programmed from our parents' preconception dietary and lifestyle choices, your mother's dietary and lifestyle choices during pregnancy, and all sorts of exposures and things that happen to you in early childhood as well. Arguably, it continues your whole life. But that first thousand days concept is that there's a period of um, fetal programming or susceptibility to these like epigenetic changes, like your genetic expression, your development will be, be influenced by these early exposures. Mm -hmm. So if you look at like our generation and maybe even a generation before us, you have 
children born to mothers who lived through like the earliest period where we had our dietary guidelines, like the early 1980s, we had our first dietary guidelines, which are high carb, low fat. And you have thus a generation of children born to mothers with this, what I consider very abnormal macronutrient ratio. I mean, a, a traditional like American diet from like, you know, turn of the, the previous century, um, you would have been eating a pretty significant amount of animal foods. Your food would essentially mm -hmm. all be local and organic. We didn't have like industrial agriculture back then. Mm -hmm. Like we didn't have margarine widespread yet. People were still mm -hmm. eating like butter and animal fats. There was of course lots of physical labor still being done. So more yes. activity. Nowadays, we have like children born to families that are sedentary, eating high carbohydrate. Um, we didn't even really start screening for gestational diabetes routinely until more like the 1990s and the early 2000s. It depends on which country you're looking at, but it wasn't really routine. And when you are born to a mother who had high blood sugar during pregnancy, your the development of your pancreas is different. So when you have like an uncontrolled gestational diabetes situation, the pancreas grows larger and produces more insulin. And these children are actually born insulin resistant from wow. day one. And their risk for developing type 2 diabetes or obesity by the time they're teenagers varies from any, anywhere from 6 to 19 fold higher so we have like a generation of people who really have like some degree of pre-programmed insulin resistance, like their wow. pancreatic function, their mitochondrial function, hundred percent of the mitochondria you inherit is from your mom. Paternal mitochondria is destroyed after the egg is fertilized. You are inheriting your mom's metabolic health. And so there's no a certain degree of this where with dietary and lifestyle change, you can mitigate some of these things. Mm -hmm. um, I've talked to like Rob Wolf a number of times, for example, and he believes mm -hmm. like he probably inherited metabolic dysfunction from his mom. Mm -hmm. He's just very, very sensitive to too many carbohydrates. I don't want to like <laughs> put words in his mouth, but we've had, we've had this discussion um, several times how it's like, you know, no matter what, you, he can only push the needle so much. He maintains yeah. great metabolic health, but it takes a lot of extra work. So when we're looking at like these skyrocketing rates of childhood obesity and childhood type two diabetes, I mean, it used to be called adult onset diabetes because you didn't see it in kids. Yeah. So mm. we can't just blame like, oh, the kids are sedentary. <laughs> they're drinking soda. They're eating poor quality foods. Like Kids were also doing that generations ago as well, um, maybe mm -hmm. more so now, but it's like there was some pre-programming, the, the, their genetics, their pancreas, like there were epigenetic changes that happened that has essentially made those risk factors greater as they grow up. So yeah, I think our generation does have to be a little more tuned in to thinking about our blood sugar regulation because we didn't all get dealt a great hand mm -hmm. of cards here. Mm -hmm. I'm so happy I asked that question because that explanation, I don't think I've ever heard put in those terms before. That was super helpful. And I think I actually have heard Rob Wolf on a podcast talking about the maternal mitochondria, you know, and then impacting his metabol. So that's really fascinating that you've also had that conversation with him. Um, yeah. So just to wrap up this whole blood sugar conversation, the glucose test at the end of pregnancy, which basically just measures, can your body come back to normal after we flood your system with glucose, which feels incredibly unnatural. And it's you've, I've taken the test three times. It feels terrible. I now know you can opt out. Um, yeah. But I remember even talking to my midwife before I switched to a home birth midwife. So my OB midwife, right? My hospital midwife was like, yeah, we just don't have the studies, you know, to make it safe enough for you to just eat a banana. And I'm like, really? You're not going to let me just eat a banana? Like, so tangent aside, yeah. how does that miss the mark on understanding your true metabolic health when we're just looking at fasted glucose and then maybe your ability to come back down to normal after we flood your system with that, you know, orange or clear glucose beverage during the glucose test where yeah. does that miss the mark yeah i've written about this um a lot and spoken about it a lot 
mm-hmm. because um, again, me being kind of between two, two worlds on one hand, a glucose tolerance test is a one and done deal allows you to identify at least like the most severe cases mm-hmm. rapidly. But then on the other hand, there's like, is it even natural to be able to withstand an excessive glucose load <laughs> like that? Yeah. Um, and secondly, does it make sense for everybody to be subjected to that exact same type of test? Like, are there other yeah. alternatives? So I think it's certainly an option. Somebody who's like uh, regularly, just somebody consuming a regular American diet or just has like a, just a high carb intake. If you're metabolically uh, in a good place, you, you really should. And your, your pancreas is adapted to like coming off of that crazy, um, blood sugar high with a significant release of insulin. You should pass the test, uh, no problem. But there are those of us who don't eat as high of a carbohydrate intake and our pancreas isn't, uh, regularly releasing large quantities of insulin because there's no trigger for it. Our blood sugar is so stable. Um, those tests can sometimes result in a false positive, which is Mm. unfortunate. Um, I'll give a really interesting example, which is actually an animal study. So they've taken pregnant horses and they've fed them either their, uh, you know, grass diet, their species appropriate diet, grass and hay and greens, roughage fiber, or given them a grain ration. And then they subject them after about a week or so at eating such a diet to a glucose tolerance test. The horses that are eating their species appropriate diet of mainly grasses and greens fails the glucose tolerance Mm. test. The pregnant mares who are given the grain ration, essentially they've adapted to a high carb intake, they pass the glucose tolerance test. Mm. So it makes it seem like, oh, well, The ones Mm -hmm. eating the grains maybe have like better blood sugar control. It's not necessarily, they're just adapted to regularly tamping down that big spike in blood sugar. It's funny because in these animal studies, they just describe it as like, oh, the animal adapted to that type of diet, but like there's nothing wrong with the horses eating the diet that they should be eating. Like we're not pathologizing a high response to this huge unnatural bolus of sugar. But if you look at human studies looking at, you know, a glucose tolerance test, they'll say like, oh, a low carb diet causes insulin resistance and worsens your glucose tolerance and you fail the test. I, yeah. We're just, we're just missing the mark because unfortunately these tests are not, they're not also testing your insulin levels. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like I would take a uh, slight delay in bringing a blood sugar spike down, but have my insulin levels in check over having excessively high insulin all the time, but able to withstand like a high uh, carbohydrate load and bring it down very quickly, right? So it's like, I don't mean to to make this a little bit uh, more technical than it needs to be, but I think there's, you know, very good question raised over whether it's even natural for our bodies to withstand that. Um, And my recommendation for people who don't want to do a glucose tolerance test, if you can manage to convince your provider to accept an alternative, Mm -hmm. is to just test your blood sugar for a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. And now that we have CGMs more widely available, although sometimes it can be tricky to get them during pregnancy, um, you can wear a CGM and see what's going on. I do also recommend double checking your CGM's accuracy with a finger stick and a regular glucometer, or you can just get a regular glucometer and test your blood sugar for a couple of weeks, first thing in the morning and after each meal and see, see how you're doing, see real time responses to food. Um, that of course takes like a level of dedication to actually stick with that. And sometimes the financial investment too. So that's not going to be like appropriate for every person, but I think for, for those more like proactive types and especially the ones who are just not wanting to take in a massive quantity of sugar and you just want to like prove like, Hey, my blood sugar is actually fine. Leave me alone. Mm -hmm. Um, that is certainly a viable option. Uh, but yeah, of course we don't have perfect data to say this is, you know, 
a hundred percent a perfect replacement to a glucose tolerance test because there's just a it's just a different school of thought like yeah. entirely you know it's like one group wants to have a checkbox like high or low or like diagnosed or not diagnosed. And another group is kind of looking at this gray area. It takes a clinician who really is very familiar with blood sugar readings and how those readings actually, you know, you have different guidelines for pregnancy. Um, It takes like a more astute eye to see if you have an issue or not just by looking at two weeks of blood sugar readings. That's Mm -hmm. something that not all clinicians are trained in. So But ultimately, at the end of the day, the like potential consequences to mother or baby from high blood sugar, it doesn't matter whether you have a diagnosis or not. It matters where your blood sugar is at. So Mm -hmm. you can take a glucose tolerance test and get a false negative and you actually have an issue, but nobody's testing your blood sugar. I mean, like I'm an advocate for everybody keeping an eye on their blood sugar at least every once in a while, but especially during pregnancy to see like am I keeping this well-regulated or is it not? Because sometimes it does take more than diet and exercise to get them in a healthy range. Yeah. This glucose test really quickly. Cause I don't know. Cause because <laughs> I've never done it because I've never, I don't know what this is. Bless your heart. So, um, this is right after you've given birth. No, 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 no. You're what is it? Like 34 weeks? You're just 24 to 28 weeks typically. Okay. Okay, so 24 to 28 weeks pregnant. Okay. So you're just rounding out your second trimester. And you have to drink this like really, really sugary liquid. It's disgusting. You feel like your bones are going to... It's soda, typically. That's gross. It used to be... And the idea is they want to to just crank... They want to jack up your glucose or your blood sugar to make sure that your insulin is responding and bringing your blood sugar back down. So it's an artificial environment. You would never, hopefully not... I don't even know the milligrams or... Does the, it have to be a huge spike? It depends on how the test is done. There's like different versions of a glucose tolerance test. So mm-hmm. some versions in the in the US, they have a two-part test. They'll give you a glucose challenge test of 50 grams of glucose in a little like eight ounce bottle of liquid That's and so see your response an hour after. And then if you don't pass that test, they will give you a 100 gram oh. test and they'll look at your blood sugar fasting and then every hour for three hours afterwards and then there's a different one that's just a single test 75 gram glucose tolerance test where they test you fasting and then one and two hours afterwards and internationally almost unanimously they all use the 75 gram in the states we still put it in this two-step method um, Mm. which actually is (laughs) not very evidence-based but nonetheless Mm -hmm. that's how most of the u.s does it and the purpose for this is to, to see, <laughs> right? Like, like just, just like a, Hey, let's just make sure that, you know, the, the mother of this you know, upcoming child is, is going to be able to handle like, why is that? They want to make sure that the mother's blood sugar is not too high. Okay. And the, the consequence of blood sugar being too high in pregnancy are, are numerous. Um, it can mm-hmm. change babies like growth trajectory they usually grow too large not because they're exuberantly healthy but they actually put on significantly more fat because the mother's blood sugar is high and then the baby's pancreas at a certain stage of pregnancy can release insulin and so the baby's also obsessed about blood sugar control so the baby's pancreas will pump out lots and lots and lots of insulin which results in the baby gaining a lot of fat so they're like metabolically unhealthy from birth Mm -hmm. it can slow down lung development. Um, it can lead to some challenges. Well, certainly mom's at a high risk for preeclampsia, which has its own challenges. But then at birth, it actually can be a risk factor for neonatal hypoglycemia. So because the baby's, that's your, your the baby's blood sugar is too low, essentially. So that happens, you'd think like, oh, well, why wouldn't the baby's blood sugar be high? You just told me their blood sugar is high and they're pumping out lots of insulin. Well, when they're born and you cut the cord, you cut off Mm. the sugar supply, but their insulin Mm. production is still high. And so they, their blood sugar tanks. Babies are actually designed to be fat adapted at birth. They're usually burning ketones and they're in deep ketosis, um, especially in the first like week or so after birth, but at least the first month. But if they've been exposed to tons and tons of sugar and their insulin production is really high, 
they're sugar adapted and so they crash. And if you crash really hard, I mean, it, it is life threatening if your blood sugar mm. drops too low, um, but it often needs to be, you know, medically managed. It can result in, you know, stays in the NICU because of the blood sugar dysregulation, but also the um, underdevelopment of the lungs. It's a whole thing. Mm hmm. Wow. Yeah, if you remember when we did our glucose episode, and I remember when I was reading that book, and I kept like reading passages out to you, yeah. of like this is a detrimental effect of when you're constantly spiking totally. your blood sugar. So imagine being at that elevated state all the time, and all those repercussions happening. It's like mm -hmm. glucose is phenomenal; it's our energy source in the body. But if it's circulating in your system at too high of levels, it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. It's something I think I didn't focus on enough early on and now it's something that i tell everyone I'm, I'm looking at the book right now i'm like go read the book it's so interesting because like the thought there is because it makes some sense right i mean other than and I, I like how lily put it because she's like i'm kind of in both worlds a little because i, I recognize sense, yeah. you, know, you want to make sure that this person can regulate their glucose sure levels right and that they don't have to it's almost like it's easier to test that they can take the spike and recover than it is to constantly monitor and say, Correct. hey, you're spiking Correct. right now, there could be issues. Yeah. And, and so that, costs, that, that, that makes sense. It costs the healthcare system less money to just do a glucose tolerance test. Mm -hmm. mm. And then again, like just having had that foot in the conventional world, you know, there, there's a significant amount of people who are just not interested in their health, you know? Yeah. What, mm. Like we're in this weird bubble in this online space talking about health all the time and you have all these homesteaders <laughs> and people growing their own food and farmers and regenerative <laughs> ag. I mean, the vast majority of the United States, like people really don't take their health seriously, whether that's yeah. lack of education or resources or access or whatever. But like just getting them to come in to even take the test is like a big step. Um but a lot of times we really are identifying, you know, blood sugar issues that were pre-existing for a long time. So just mm -hmm. to give like a, just a little background story, like I started my career in Los Angeles and I was working in a uh, low income perinatology clinic where we specialized in gestational diabetes. Like mm -hmm. the OB at our office was literally the chief of perinatology at the big hospital nearby. And it's been... 30 years plus of her career working on gestational diabetes. So we wow. were like very progressive in our testing and our management. And so we would screen everybody in their first trimester with a hemoglobin A1C. Mm -hmm. And if that came back in the pre-diabetic range, they were treated as if they had gestational diabetes. This is in wow. the California Diabetes and Pregnancy Program like policy guidelines, which I also worked on. And so these these women never went on to take a glucose tolerance test because your blood sugar issues were already identified in early pregnancy. Then you have two thirds of the pregnancy to work on it versus getting yeah. diagnosed really essentially at the third trimester and having a couple months at best. Mm -hmm. But we could like intervene early and prevent like a whole additional trimester or more of exposure to high blood sugar um, by changing, you know, dietary and lifestyle choices. And with my recommendations, which were different than conventional, really prevented the majority of them needing medication or insulin as well. But like the, va again, the vast majority of what we caught, we caught early. It was very yeah. rare that somebody would pass the hemoglobin A1C because if you passed, you would go on and do a 24 to 28 week glucose tolerance test, right? Very rare mm -hmm. that we would have somebody who passed like the early screening and then would have to go and take a glucose tolerance test again because the majority of cases it was pre-diabetes mm -hmm. and a1c it, correct me if i'm wrong but the way i've understood that is like that's basically getting giving you a snapshot of your last two to three months of glucose regulation because it's showing you the amount of like red blood cells that have been glycated by excess glucose in the bloodstream. Is that correct? Correct. So it's like how much of your hemoglobin molecules are like caramel coated from yeah, like your blood sugar being too high. Yeah. 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 Caramel coated. Caramel coated. Well, caramel co yeah, I just realized <laughs> that's what you were saying. That, that makes so much more sense because that's giving you a longer time period. This is telling you where your body's trajectory is kind of been going. Right. And then you can, yeah, it makes me wonder why we don't do that 
as a standard of care now? Like, why wouldn't you level measure? It's not hard to measure someone's A1C, I would imagine. It's we do not, it all the it's time. not a fasted test. It's not expensive. Um, yeah, it's something it's that I certainly advocate for in real food for pregnancy, at yeah. least as an early screening, you know, A1C is not a perfect lab measurement by any means. Sometimes you'll have it come out falsely low or falsely high, mm. but at least you can follow up and see, okay, well, let's start testing your blood sugar and see where it's at. You could have yeah. a situation where it's just very mild, uh, you know, blood sugar regulation issues, which means usually pretty mild changes to diet and lifestyle can bring it into range. Or sometimes it's really quite high and we need to, mm. <laughs> we need to do something about it. I mean, I've had cases where, you know, you start testing somebody's blood sugar and it's in the two and three hundreds. I mean, when you have blood sugar in the two and three hundreds, oftentimes the pregnancy actually isn't even viable because it's, it's toxic. A certain level of glucose is toxic for the baby. And there's a variety of, um, you know, birth defects associated with blood sugar that are elevated beyond a certain level. Of course, that means most birth defects develop like the, the very serious ones are in the first like eight weeks of pregnancy. So, mm-hmm. you know, ideally preconception blood sugar is in a good place. Mm-hmm. If you have a high result at, at 24 to 28 weeks, um, you should not be concerned about birth defects necessarily because your pregnancy is still viable. But a lot of women with pre existing diabetes really have challenges conceiving um, and challenges with like recurrent miscarriage be, because of. These, some of these defects are fatal. Um, so yeah, it's, it's wild. It's a whole trajectory of like gestational diabetes is overdiagnosed or it's not a real thing, or this glucose tolerance test is terrible and it has bad ingredients. And why are you drinking so much sugar? And then there's just a, there's a broad spectrum of, um, information we have to consider when we're talking about this, this condition. Yeah, that's what I so appreciate about you and your work is that you lay things out really like kind of no nonsense. Let's just look at the research. Let's pull information. And you're not like this big fear mongering attitude. Your book is so, um, I'm going to say easy to read in the way that you wrote it. Like I felt like you were just talking to me and like I read your book so fast when I was pregnant, but also so packed with research. And so you do a really good job of balancing both of those worlds. Thank you. Um, I want to talk to, first of all, I want to ask you this question and then I want to get into the whole fertility conversation because I know that's a big topic in our community. I was actually just in conversation with someone who is really struggling with fertility. And I just usually I'm like, Hey, the Weston A. Price foundation has tons of information, go check them out. And they, then they have to like get on the raw dairy bandwagon. They, they have to do all this other research. Right. And so if you're not in that world, it can be really scary for Mm -hmm. you. Totally understand. I've been there, but for you personally, what are some of the nutrients that you're going to eat that, that maybe you're going to focus on in fertility or pre I guess, preconception and pregnancy more so than your everyday diet. Assuming someone is following like a generally nourished diet, say they're following like Weston A. Price recommendations where they're, they're not scared of their saturated fat or their dietary cholesterol. They're eating maybe nose to tail. They're in this ancestral space. What on top of that are you consuming for those periods of your life or are they pretty much the same throughout? So what does that look like? Yeah, I mean... For somebody who's already kind of dialed into Weston Price stuff, and I mean, I was introduced to Weston Price stuff as a as a teenager, mm-hmm. <laughs> so it like it it even colored my um, my view of going through dietetic school, right? Because I'm balancing wow. both worlds. It was like, hmm, that doesn't exactly line up. Um, if you've been eating kind of Weston Price style, well, I think we have to give a little caveat as you kind of led into about the blood sugar testing thing, like eating more nutrient dense foods or foods that are prepared more traditionally, Mm -hmm. that looks different for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And so like speaking from my own experience, I'm pretty sure I got introduced to like nourishing traditions when I was maybe 15 or 16 was vegetarian at the time. Um, (laughs) for me that like my first thing was like, Oh, I'm going to 
soak my oatmeal overnight. Mm. And it's like, it was more in the like quality of the grains and my diet was still very heavily, uh, you know, leaning on the carbohydrates and not leaning enough on like macronutrient balance Mm. and enough protein. Like I embraced fat and butter and the fermented grains and, um, certain preparation techniques, but like it didn't have, it still didn't have enough protein. Like it takes, I think we have to give ourselves a little grace because it takes a lot of time for us to make these sorts of changes, but just eating nourishing tradition style doesn't necessarily mean you have everything all dialed in. So I would say like, yes to the food quality. Yes. If you tolerate grains, you know, fermented sprouted grains, sourdough and all that, but are you getting good macronutrient balance? I mean, the same principles, I sometimes use the phrase, real food is real food. Like, it doesn't matter what stage of life you are. Yes, my books have focused on like specific areas and the research is all on these specific areas, but you can pull different research for different areas of life that back essentially the same things. Like, the food that's good for human beings is good at all life stages. Mm -hmm. And so macronutrient balance preconception, pregnancy, postpartum, it looks fairly similar. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of people that looks like eating more protein than they're used to eating, Mm -hmm. uh, of course, continuing to not fear fat as you probably, that's one of the easiest things to get on board with because like butter is so delicious. Mm -hmm. Um, but I would say also just take a look at your balance in terms of carbohydrates. Like are, is your plate really heavily shifted towards, you know, you have your soaked rice that's cooked in bone broth and you have like a side of buttered sourdough bread and you have roasted acorn squash and you have a little salad and you have your meat. Like that's a great meal, but that might be too much carbohydrate for your body to Mm -hmm. handle. Like it depends person to person. You can have somebody who's ridiculously athletic and they actually need that. But Mm -hmm. for the vast majority of majority of us who are not elite athlete level, um, we probably need to be like choosing maybe one or two carbohydrate choices and focusing a little more on, on the proteins and the non-starchy vegetables at that meal to maintain that blood sugar balance. Mm -hmm. Um, also when it comes to, you know, ovulatory function and egg quality, blood sugar again, and insulin plays a big role in that as well. So, you know, that, that eggs that we release at ovulation, I mean, if you're looking all the way back to when they were recruited from a follicle as this little undeveloped egg, essentially, I mean, that whole process to take it all the way to ovulation is upwards of like six to eight months the most wow. crucial stages uh, where your nutrient intake especially impacts egg quality is in the last three months before ovulation. But still, you're looking back over kind of like a long period of time. Mm-hmm. And for sperm, it's over 70 days. So again, like that kind of three-month window preconception. And when you, I mean, if we go back to talking about um, mitochondrial health, I mean, the, the human egg has more mitochondria by far than any other cell in the body. It's highly, highly metabolically active and a variety of nutrients are really important for mitochondrial function. Protein and a number of amino acids are huge. Um, Blood sugar balance and like our insulin levels can affect it. And then a variety of micronutrients are CoQ10, our B vitamins, our vitamin E, um, certain minerals. They all really play a role in maintaining the health of that very, very important cell. Um, So yes, like we need to prioritize certain things. How much that's different from your day to day really depends on where you're at. (laughs) Like, Mm -hmm. um, what's your starting point? Um, and for like, for myself having spent like decades sort of refining my diet, you know, kind of like getting over the hump of like, oh, wow, maybe this reactive hypoglycemia I've been dealing with my entire life is because I'm not eating enough protein. Oh, interesting. You know, like some of these things take a really long time for it to all make sense in our bodies. 
um, and just be worked into our lifestyle. But like for me, I didn't really change a significant amount because I had like, you know, decades of eating fairly nutrient dense leading up to pregnancy. Um, Mm. Certainly there's like a greater role when it comes to preventing certain birth defects, like neural tube defects. There's a greater role for folate, choline, um, vitamin B12, glycine, which you find in collagen rich foods. And so emphasizing your leafy greens, your liver, your legumes, your nose to tail animal foods, like your bone broth and stuff or your glycine. Um, those are things that I tended to focus on a little more, um, Mm. eating more fatty fish that has more DHA and iodine. Some of the, some of the most important nutrients I'd say that we get from seafood. I tried to make a greater emphasis on consuming those because unless you live really coastally, at least for me, that's one of those things that tends to be like an afterthought, (laughs) you know, Mm -hmm. like, Oh yeah, maybe I should incorporate like a fish meal this week. Right. Yeah. Um, Those were things that I did a little bit extra, but it it doesn't have to be a real substantial departure from from your usual diet. Mm. I'm so happy you made the differentiation between sort of the traditional ancestral diet and a focus on macronutrients. I see this too play out online in like the pro-metabolic space where people get really zoned into proper preparations of yes. grains and, and stuff like that. And they miss the protein and they end up way dysregulating their yep. blood sugar. And I just, if we keep saying it, right? We keep talking about the importance of protein. But if you think about it too, like the foods you're eating that consume that protein are also going to have those amazing benefits. Like we do eat a lot of meat with all the connective tissue and the bones and we make stews and we make meat stocks. And so like if I were to get pregnant again, I would be prioritizing my meat, my meat stocks. Um, For me, my raw dairy, I I truly, if you are sourcing dairy from a reputable source and, and you're educated on the raw dairy side of it, it's a powerhouse for me. I'm like, it's one of the most important foods I consume every day. So that's what I would be doing. I'm not a dietitian, right? I can't give advice. But for me, this is what I would do. And I would up my eggs probably. And then yeah, I wouldn't neglect my vegetables. I think it can, we can tend to like, go really carb heavy, but then think like, oh, but we're making beautiful sourdough. It's like, but still, you can't just, you can't forget about what you're missing by consuming an excess of that macronutrient. Now you're not getting in the yeah. other the other foods you might need. Yeah, I've definitely. I feel like I'm learning something. I'm gonna make a statement. And I want people to correct me. So here's the thought: in, <laughs> in in the in the running world, right? We have this this term. We call it couch to 5K or couch to marathon or and, and the, the the term implies I'm starting from nothing. So I've got no foundation. I, I haven't run yet. I'm. I'm as out of shape in for, for, for running condition as I can possibly be. Uh-huh. And so if, if we were to use that term and say from couch to like, let's call it well-nourished pre-pregnancy status or status, right? Um, I'm, I'm going to make the assumption based on what we're talking about right now that our first kind of like starting point on that journey would be to identify how you are consuming protein on a regular basis mm. and look into more animal-based protein is, mm-hmm. is would that be a good assertion uh, idea or is, is, is there a better option there that is that is a very good start yes <laughs> i think more i think because there's so much um noise right now about animal foods focusing on how people think they're detrimental to our health or the environment or whatever there's such a push collectively to reduce animal food consumption it's like the opposite direction i think you need to be going to optimize fertility so yes more animal foods variety though too because you get different there's different micronutrients in different animal foods um i think one that we didn't mention just right now was like including some organ meats every once in a while Mm. too which to play devil's advocate doesn't have to be eating organ meats every single day like I think people kind of forget when I talk about organ meats that I'm not saying consume them constantly like when you harvest an animal you get like one set of organs and then a whole bunch of meat right so Mm -hmm. you don't have to have organ meats um, every single meal but maybe like once a week it would be good to incorporate them just because they're so highly nutrient dense and you know, when we look at the 
risk of certain birth defects, for example, a lot of the nutrients that are concentrated in organ meats help to reduce that risk. Um, if I could just throw out one that's so controversial, vitamin A is actually really vital for reducing the risk of a number of birth defects. Mm. And all the hoopla is about vitamin A is teratogenic with something that causes birth defects. That's what that means. Um, however, like the, that, that data is based on studies from the 1990s where they dose people with high dose synthetic vitamin A. Mm. Um, when you actually look at the rates of birth defects associated with vitamin A excess over the last 30 years, you have fewer than 20 cases identified. But there's one type of birth defect called congenital diaphragmatic hernia, which has actually been on the rise. You look over the last 30 years, and there's been over a million cases. Wow. And there's very, very strong data, both animal and human data, showing a link between insufficient vitamin A levels, low retinol status in the newborns, low retinol intake and status in the moms. In the animal studies, you can like induce this defect with vitamin A deficiency or things that block vitamin A receptors and activity in the body. Um, very, very strong link to deficiency in vitamin A. And so when the, the hernia doesn't, or when the diaphragm rather doesn't form properly and there's a hole in it or hernia during this early stage of development, you can have essentially organs that should be in the digestive area grow into the chest cavity, which is where the lungs should be growing. And so you end up with significant lung underdevelopment. And some of the cases are very, very severe and sadly often fatal. Some cases that are not as severe can be corrected, but it's, it's a long road, you know, with surgeries and NICU stays and it's very stressful. It'd be ideal if we can maybe avoid these in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, and when you look at across the U.S., you know, vitamin A intake, 80% of women are not hitting the mark for retinol. And by far the best source of retinol in our diet or preformed vitamin A is liver. Mm. If we were just to get people to eat a couple ounces even of liver per week, I'm not even talking about every single day, like, like a single meal or a single portion of like, three ounces of liver once a week in that preconception window, we could correct this deficiency without getting anywhere close to the potentially toxic levels of vitamin A. Even though those studies are on synthetic vitamin A, I still like, you know, try to be as careful as possible. I don't recommend mm, exceeding sure. those levels identified in that study, even though it's natural sourced vitamin A. And even though other studies haven't necessarily repeated that unless they've given three times or more the level of vitamin A still, I'm like, we can still hit a conservatively very safe level of vitamin A intake with just a couple ounces of liver intake per week. And what if that could potentially reduce the risk of this very, very serious birth defect. Mm -hmm. um, certainly I'm not saying vitamin A is, you know, the only possible cause, but we have really quite strong data on it. I mean, we're talking 20 plus years of, of data. So, um, yeah, <laughs> just to add organ meats to the mix. That is one yeah. reason why I would add them to the mix on the preconception foods. Here's what I love about what you just said. One, you're talking about eating organ meats in the greater context of the animal. So even your ratio of like, listen, you're getting like a couple hundred pounds of muscle meat to maybe a couple pounds of organ meat. So think about your consumption in that same way. You know, we in our what's for dinner uh, like meal, like recipe guide. I have like a weekly organ, like hidden liver recipe in there. And it's just like a little bit, you're just adding a little yep. bit of liver to your ground meat. And like, you're not sitting down for a liver steak. Okay. Right. You can, but like, I don't think you need that. Um, and then the other piece that you just mentioned, because like Joey probably hasn't felt this, but vitamin A in the pregnancy world, like if you were to Google or blog or, or anything like that, you might become worried of consuming too much vitamin A just because of the general mainstream noise on the topic. And you're saying that's coming from this research done in the 50s where we hyperdosed synthetic forms of vitamin A without its respect or synergistic 
uh, application of the other vitamins, right? So we isolated it and then we, we increased this dose and we saw negative repercussions. You're saying over the last 20 some years, we've had, what did you say? Like 30? Fewer than 20 cases in the last 30 years. Okay. Fewer than 20 cases of a issue of a, of a situation where someone had too much vitamin A that solicited a birth defect, but over a million cases of a very closely related birth defect to vitamin A deficiency. So the fact that, and and then you layer on top of the fact that 80% of women are, are deficient in retinol, which is the preformed vitamin A, the, the vitamin A you get from animal foods, mm. not like the uh, carrots that you're eating, right? So all of this layered together, this is why nutritional education is so complicated because you can take one study and then the mainstream dietary advice will blow that up to where you're like, oh, I shouldn't avoid my, I shouldn't eat that liver because it's really high in vitamin A and I don't want to cause a birth defect. But in reality, we have an underconsumption of vitamin A, a vitamin A deficiency, and we're seeing over a million cases of this birth defect, which I just saw someone on Instagram, baby was just born with this. Yeah. And th it's devastating it's for the It's absolutely tragic. Yeah. It's, it's truly, truly terrible. I feel like as I got older and got into parenthood, right, and seeing this from the you know father's point of view, mm -hmm. I was completely blindsided. Or, and, and I'd love to know if there's studies or if, Lily, if you have data on this, just because I'm curious. And maybe I'm just throwing a curveball here, so I apologize. But no one talked about how frequent and or common it would be for me and people around me to have miscarriages and mm. birth defects. I was completely oh, yeah. blindsided by yeah. that coming into parenthood. Mm -hmm. I feel like growing up, it was anyone like my aunts and uncles or my parents' friends. When I was little, someone got pregnant. It was always a celebration. There was yeah. never like, how's baby doing? How's mom doing? I feel like nowadays. It's so common. It's like, it's, it's so common. And, and again, maybe I'm just now aware of it and it was always happening or it's, it's gotten more frequent. I don't know. I'd be curious to hear what you guys think about that. Mm. Well, I mean, as a whole, there there is just a built-in risk of miscarriage with any any pregnancy. Um, mm. It does seem to be certainly fertility issues are on the rise. I don't know that I have data specifically on whether miscarriage rate is on the rise, but certainly just chances of conception um, are down. Um, mm. But when you look at the risk of Miscarriage, I mean, oftentimes when there is a significant anomaly or defect, different ways of saying the same thing, sometimes the pregnancy just isn't viable anymore, which would result in a miscarriage. Also, that could just happen. And a lot of time that's due to no fault of the parents whatsoever. It's just a chromosomal abnormality. Um, you know, not everything goes perfect in nature. I mean, look mm -hmm. at like... <laughs> the leaves on a tree, like not every leaf is formed perfectly. Like some of them are just a little bit off. Right. Um, but the percent of pregnancies ending in loss really does significantly vary by maternal age, which this kind of ends up being a controversial area because of course women can conceive, um, well into their later reproductive years, but people don't talk about the percent of pregnancies ending in loss does dramatically increase with age. So like mm. in your 20s, um, rate of miscarriage mm. is like 12%. Before age 35, it's like 16%. Then you start to get over 35, it's 25%. You get from age 40 to 44, it's 48% of pregnancies end in loss. And then over 45, 83% of pregnancies end in loss. Wow. So there, there is a dramatic decrease in typically, I mean, we can offset some of this with our dietary and lifestyle choices. I don't want to make it sound like completely dire, but there is a built in like age related decline in our mitochondrial function, which ultimately impacts the quality of our eggs as well. Mm -hmm. It happens in men too with sperm quality, although to a lesser degree, because women, of course, our reproductive years hit an end point at menopause and men keep producing sperm their entire life. But mm -hmm. the quality does tend to, sperm quality does tend to decline with age. Mm 
Um, so, yeah. So maybe there's like a, as people are getting married older, and yeah. maybe, maybe that even could play into this with, with those percentages you were kind of talking about. Oh yeah, a lot of people are delaying pregnancy until until later. And, and then we have to factor the men into the equation too. I mean, half of infertility cases have some male factor component and 30% of couples with infertility, it's entirely male factor. Um, so sperm quality has gone dramatically down and mm -hmm. even the guidelines for identifying, um, whether the a sperm sample is healthy or unhealthy or fertile or non-fertile, um, those parameters have gone way down. It's like astronomical. Um, in my next book, we have a whole chapter on, on sperm quality and it goes through how those guidelines have changed. So what used to be considered normal is now like probably the top like 99% of uh, sperm quality samples you'd get from men living now. Wow. Have you seen, there's like stuff circulating social media that says like by 20, I'm going to totally butcher this date. It's like within five years. Sperm, I think it's specifically talking about sperm quality is going to be so low that um, infertility rates are going to skyrocket. Have you seen this? Do you know I have seen saying? that. And I, I try not to play into like the doomsday scenario because yeah. I also have to like counter this with my very real world experience of working with so many in the conventional space, so many mm -hmm. couples that were just extremely unhealthy. I mean, there's like overt diabetes, you know, that's not super well controlled, uh, all sorts of economic limitations on the quality of the food consumed, like all sorts of toxic exposures. Nothing is perfect. And yet they still reproduce and have generally pretty healthy babies. I mean, maybe mm. there's a little epigenetic imprinting where that child's at a higher risk for type two diabetes or something, you know, but like maybe it's not optimal health, but they still like the human body pulls through. And this is mm. like somebody who came into my office with like a big gulp from seven up <laughs> with like red dye number 40 in it and like 140 grams of sugar. And it's like, man, if that isn't a testament to how much our bodies just work to create and support life despite imperfect circumstances. I mean, mm -hmm. wow. Yeah, I really appreciate that perspective because those viral posts go viral because all of a sudden people are freaking out and there's a lot of fear. Yeah. I think, I think, yeah. And then when you step away from the phone screen right and you get out in the environment and you're like the human body is resilient it's the same thing of like the human body wants to heal if you get out oh, of its yeah. way the, the human body wants to give birth naturally if you get out of its way right yep. all of these examples of that i know i've experienced that personally so um absolutely i think our yeah. bodies do gener i mean i just have a, a genuine maybe it's how i was raised but i also just have a genuine knowing like any symptom your body is throwing your way is really an invitation to step in mm. and listen. I yeah. mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. The improvement that you can have in ovulatory function, the menstrual cycle, egg quality, just with some very simple dietary and lifestyle changes. Like sometimes it is as simple as ramping up the protein, like maybe supplementing with some specific nutrients. If, if you happen to be low in them, like getting your circadian rhythm back in a good place, like getting to sleep at a reasonable hour in a dark room and mm -hmm. finding ways to manage our stress or going for a walk after lunch. Like it's not always these big heavy lifts that can have a pretty dramatic difference. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I don't know if we do end up with a society that's just completely sedentary, uh, living off almost entirely ultra processed foods. I mean, that really makes it very difficult for your body to maintain fertility, both men and women. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just in a conversation with a friend and she's gone through all these fertility doctors and you know food is never really mentioned it's always kind of other thing it's go on blood thinners let's do this let's do this 
And I said, you know, I think sometimes we have this assumption that changing your diet is like the slow route, like it takes a really long time for, you know, dietary change to impact something like colitis or Crohn's or or whatever's going on. I said, but sometimes I think for me personally, I'm, I'm considering I'm fueling my body every single day. I could tell a day that I've eaten poorly and a day that I've really nourished myself. So in my mind, that's flipped. I'm like food is the fastest way for change because you have an opportunity and invitation every single day to work on your nourishment. And if you're undernourished and in those important, which I want to talk about this in a second, but in those important vitamins, those fat soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K, if you're undernourishing your proper fats, if you're not getting enough calories in general I know so many women that under eat it's like of course you feel like garbage of course you feel like trash and I wish that we didn't look at food as like oh it's the long road you know right yes there are elements of that that take a long time to heal but my goodness switching immediately from say a really processed dairy product to beautiful fermented raw dairy is like wow the change is incredible for for our family personally so um, I want to get into some of this fear around cholesterol and, and saturated fat and how you bust through some of those maybe myths that we might have gotten from mainstream dietary advice, right? So what's your perspective on those two pieces? So fat, of course, is just a very controversial topic. I mean, even, mm-hmm. you know, the most conventionally vilified fat, saturated fat, that has been blamed for heart disease and all sorts of health problems. If you actually look at the newer data, it's been shown to have at best a net neutral, or I should say at worst, a net neutral effect Mm -hmm. on heart health. And there's actually studies showing that those with higher saturated fat intake have a lower risk of stroke. So Mm -hmm. it, it perplexes me that this is still such a point of contention because what has happened by us vilifying saturated fat and cholesterol is we have instead had to replace those foods with something else and usually it ends up being replaced with more carbohydrates so you look at like what are the foods that have saturated fat and cholesterol and then you look at which are the foods that have all of these um, key micronutrients for supporting fertility and pregnancy and fetal development and all that it's the same foods. So if you're just going to overtly omit everything that has saturated fat and cholesterol, you're omitting pretty much all of your most nutrient dense foods. Yeah. There was a um, study, I actually think I did a research brief on it on my Instagram somewhere, uh, something about like, what are the most nutrient dense foods on the planet? And they analyze sort of world worldwide data on on uh, food nutrient databases um, as it related to six key micronutrients. Mm. Okay, we're only looking at six micronutrients. Yes, that's going to have some issues, but it included a number of key nutrients like vitamin B12, for example. And on that list, everything was animal foods except dark leafy greens. Mm. (laughs) Every single thing that was the best source of all of these key micronutrients were animal foods. Um, The second thing that I think is, it's always been a little bit perplexing to me is that it's common knowledge that all of our steroid hormones, like our sex hormones, like estrogen and progesterone, they're derived from cholesterol. Mm -hmm. And when you do studies that intentionally restrict fat and cholesterol intake in women, it consistently results in lower hormone levels. And sometimes you're looking at like a 30 or 50% lower level of these hormones. Like you cannot maintain ovarian function and reproduction if your hormone levels are in the toilet. Mm -hmm. So just from a, just if we're going to single out like the childbearing years, at the very least, low fat intake does not make any sense during those years because you're not going to be able to maintain hormone balance. And in fact, when you look at, there's a condition called hypothalamic amenorrhea, where it's women who have lost their ovulatory function, they've lost their menstrual cycle. 
And this is often seen in women who are significantly under eating and or over exercising. And when you look at their dietary intake, they often have a significant under intake of fat. Mm. Like they're eating like half the amount of fat that anybody else eats or even less. Like it's an unnatural fear of fat. Um, and lo and behold, what happens? Ovulatory function just completely dries up. Certainly, you know, they need to be eating more energy as a whole, more calories as a whole, but specifically they're often really under eating fat. And it's like, if you have, you know, your hormones are built on a backbone of cholesterol, it's like, you can't build the house without the lumber. Like you can't build your hormones without cholesterol. So mm -hmm. you're going to run into a problem there. And yeah, your body can manufacture some cholesterol in the liver, but that also puts a massive strain on the liver to have to take up the entire role of manufacturing all of the cholesterol that your body needs. It's yeah. like significantly easier to just eat some, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I digress. No, I, I think that's super helpful. And some, I'm still kind of trying to unpack this. I honestly want to do a whole episode on cholesterol and fat because the book I'm reading right now talks about how when you dissect a like the argument for cholesterol is like oh it can build up in your arteries as plaque and then that can lead to restricted blood flow or stroke or heart attack right so and then it's like when you when you really dissect what that plaque is it's mostly calcium um and then cholesterol in the body is kind of like um <clears throat> the repair like it has a repairing function so then the the new analysis of this is not that cholesterol caused the plaque but that cholesterol is there located on site it's guilty by association because it's trying to repair uh, maybe a lesion on the wall the wall lining of the um, artery or vein that you're you're dealing with there so I found that so interesting to me that I'm like all of these years we're associating cholesterol with poor maybe circulatory health or, or or heart disease and all these things when in reality maybe cholesterol is playing the cleanup role and it's being guilty by association again I I might be totally off this is something I'm I'm reading about currently and I really want to dig into more but it just reminds me that there's it's really easy to take these one off statements of like vitamin A causes, you know, toxicity in pregnancy and you should avoid it and cholesterol is bad for you. And right. I just had someone message me the other day that was like, My doctor told me I should stop eating butter and switch to margarine because my cholesterol's high. And I was like, <laughs> We already know that like dietary cholesterol doesn't doesn't really make it to blood serum levels like it's not like eating a bunch of now saturated fat i think there is more of a connection but like yeah i i messaged them and i was like yeah that's really interesting i'm surprised that they still hold that posture knowing what we know now you know yeah so it it's it frustrates me that it takes a long time for these recommendations that impact people right now like people right now are being given this advice that is ill-intended or or just not really the full picture yeah so it's helpful when you hear someone who who has a broader understanding like you explain this and gives us folks kind of like more confidence mm -hmm. in, in our dietary choices because I have never felt better than yeah. how we eat and I yeah. eat I think I'm around I wish I could I think I'm around like 70 I don't know your dietary um I'm around, yeah, like 78, 80 grams of fat per day. Does that sound on par? Is that low? Should I, I don't know. I honestly don't usually give a specific recommendation on fat because okay. for me, the two more important things to focus on, A is the protein, mm -hmm. B is the carbs, and then the mm -hmm. fat kind of just figures itself out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. It's sort of like the last one, but yeah, 70 to 80 grams doesn't necessarily sound too low. There's certainly some people who do, you know, quite a bit more, um, mm -hmm. you know, the ratios and everything all really depends on your total caloric needs and the macronutrient breakdown, whether you're looking at it in grams of these macronutrients or percentage of calories, like everything is re in relation to one another. Um, yeah. 
you might actually, I don't know if you've come across the work of Dave Feldman of Cholesterol Code. He would be a very Ooh. interesting person to interview on the cholesterol front. Yes. Um, yeah, his, his work is pretty great. Um, but I, I agree with your overarching, uh, I, I'm of the same opinion that cholesterol actually isn't the bad guy necessarily it's like the firefighter who's there at yeah. the scene of the fire putting out totally. trying to put out the damage and um yeah there's there's so the arterial calcification issue is huge and often overlooked the issue of oxidized uh lipids is mm. also way overlooked um and the uh, particle size, so whether your cholesterol is like fluffy and buoyant or small and dense, um, mm -hmm. as can be examined on like a more advanced lipid panel, like that has a, it, that'll have a differential effect on your cardiovascular risk as well. I think mm -hmm. it's just, um, I think people really like to assume that we have these sort of like perfect lab parameters where like, if this, then this. Yeah. And the truth is there is still so much controversy in the healthcare space and the nutrition research on what parameters are optimal or problematic or whether this correlation doesn't really have anything to do with anything it's just what happens to be being observed because something else is going on that's actually a problem mm -hmm. um we see that in even like the nutrient levels like trying to assess iron status like good luck it's like they're still arguing about what uh specific markers and what cutoff points are problematic or associated with, you know, better health, like it's still up for debate and people act as if we have those perfectly ironed out. I mean, there's mm. always controversy. Um, yeah. So cholesterol is definitely, definitely a tricky one, not to mention that they've, you know, lowered the official recommendations for what is considered a healthy cholesterol level after they introduced statins on the market. So that's a whole, Ooh. that's a, a whole other black hole to dive into. Right. Yeah. I love that you said that. I, I think that's an important posture to hold, right? It's like modern day 2023 science doesn't have it all right. We don't know. I think we can fool ourselves into thinking we're this highly technologically advanced society that should know. But if anything, yeah. I think we're even more confused on the basics of life, like the basics, get your sunlight in, get your nutrients in, your water. My goodness, that's a whole other conversation too. Um, before we sign off here, I would love for you to share about the book you're currently writing because I know you're coming out with a third book and, um, tell us a little bit about what that has. Sure. So yeah, it's on fertility and I'm actually working on this book with a co-author, a friend of mine, Lisa Hendrickson, Jack, um, you might know her from her book, the fifth vital sign or her podcast, the fertility Friday podcast. Oh, and, awesome. um, yeah, we teamed up to kind of uh, have the best of both worlds. We yeah. both have, you know, a couple decades in the field, her on the, you know, menstrual cycle side and me on the nutrition side. So we teamed up to really um, give the best of both worlds instead of trying to, you know, fill in the gaps of each other or, or uh, pretend that we have expertise in something that we don't necessarily. Um, mm -hmm. It's been a really good collaborative process. So. Anyways, it, in some ways, it has some similarities to um, my pregnancy book, Real Food for Pregnancy, in that you know we dive into the macronutrients and the foods that are specifically you know beneficial, foods that might be might not as be beneficial, but all of the data is specific to fertility, which mm -hmm. is actually surprisingly very very difficult to narrow down because fertility is affected by everything mm -hmm. you know it's essentially a reflection of whole body health and yeah. so it's actually a really tricky topic um i found to research compared to uh pregnancy and of course you know i just love having my my data points so people can <laughs> see that i'm not just like 
making this stuff up. Um, So (laughs) yeah, our reference list is uh, well into the thousands and um, it's been, yeah, years, years in the making. So that'll be coming out in uh, early 2024. And I, I, it's a fine balance between trying to keep things readable, but then trying to pack in a lot of data. And I find the more, the more I write, the more I attract a really like well-educated audience who asks Mm -hmm. all the hard questions. So I'm doing Mm -hmm. my best to kind of close all the loops on a lot of different controversial topics. So like, what about the Mediterranean diet for fertility? (laughs) Like, well, here's, here's something you might not have considered. What about a vegetarian diet for fertility? I mean, there's a whole chapter on that specifically. Like when I wrote real food for pregnancy, I almost didn't even include the section on the vegetarian diet because I was like, well, it's not what I recommend. So I'm just not going to go into it. Like that's too big of a rabbit hole. And then feedback from people was like, no, I really think this needs to be in here. And Mm -hmm. so now in this book, it's like, oh man, (laughs) the the number of nutritional gaps um, are even greater than I had even imagined. And so now it's like in a whole chapter of its own, you know, there's a separate chapter on PCOS. There's a chapter on hypothalamic amenorrhea. There's a chapter on egg quality. There's a chapter on sperm quality. There's information on tracking your menstrual cycle, like identifying the, you know, proper window for conception. A lot of women have no idea that they're only fertile for six days of their cycle. And you really, Mm -hmm. only if sex is timed during that window, can you conceive? And so you could be having all the sex you want, but timing it at the wrong time. And like, you're going to think that you have a fertility problem and you might not actually have any problem. It could be a timing totally. issue. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So I'm I'm pretty excited for this to come out. There's definitely been lots and lots of requests for a resource like this. I just yes. um, I think people underestimate the amount of work that it is to write a book. It is, in my opinion, by far the hardest professional thing you can ever do, especially if you're reading thousands of studies to write a chapter. I mean, it's ridiculous. So, uh, it's been many years in the making and we're, we're, uh, definitely ready for it to be out into the world and off of our plate. Mm-hmm. Well, that's going to be such a phenomenal resource to folks. I know I have friends in my life who are going to benefit greatly from that. I'm definitely going to read that because I think you're, I, uh, someone else on a podcast said the female body prioritizes reproduction. And when reproduction breaks down, it's a greater sense or symptom that other like ultimate health is not where it needs to be. And that yeah. has really stuck with me. Like I should care about the health mm-hmm. of my like cycle, even if I'm not like trying to get pregnant right now. Absolutely. It's yeah. just part of who we are. So I think that's so, so important and something that we're not taught enough. And as I have three daughters, this is going to be a really, really important topic for me to understand as I educate them on oh, fertility yeah. and, and proper health. So I love that. Awesome. Wow. I think this episode has covered so much, but I've just really loved the conversation. So thank you again, Lily. This has been super fun for me. I don't know if you can tell, but I nerd out on these topics, (laughs) even though I have no credentials. I'm just a lay person, but it's fascinating to me. I love bringing on people like you with an expert opinion who can share their insights. So thank you so much for being on the show. Let us know where people can find you. Um, online and uh, like your website, social media, that sort of thing. Sure. Yeah. So you can find me at lilynicholsrdn.com. And up there, you can download a free chapter from Real Food for Pregnancy, which is quite popular because there's a uh, nutrient breakdown between one of my meal plans and a conventional uh, prenatal nutrition meal plan in that free chapter download. And that's something that, especially when you have like a well-informed audience like yours people forget how bad it is out there right and so they're like oh this breakfast is oatmeal strawberries and low-fat milk like (laughs) what in the world like is this in the 1980s and I'm like no this is current like this is still what we're dealing with here my friends um yeah so you can get that on my site um I have you know 250 plus free articles on there many of which are quite 
quite detailed with citations yeah. as, as always. <laughs> um, so you want to learn more about protein in pregnancy. There's an article on that. You want to learn more about liver and organ meats in pregnancy. There's an article on that, et cetera. Um, as for social media, I am most active these days on Instagram and my handle's the same as my website. So it's Lily Nichols RDN. Wonderful. Awesome. Well, thank you again for coming on the show. And I uh, can't wait to get this episode out into the masses. Yes. Thank you. Outstanding. Have a great day. You too. <laughs>